Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you're coming from. I'm Michelle Berry, the Dean for Global Health at Stanford and the Director of the Stanford Center for Innovation in Global Health. I will be moderating this, this session on environmental justice for human and planetary health. I myself trained as a tropical disease physician with a research focus on global health, but it soon became clear that climate change had become the greatest threat to global health, the planet, my children, and my children's children. As humans continue to degrade the natural environment through industrial extraction, resource consumption, and pollution, we are seeing dire, dire um, consequences for communities around the globe. Populations who have already been economically, politically, and socially marginalized are impacted the most by this. We, we really need to, in, this today, in today's session, we will explore planetary health solutions through the lens of environmental justice and with an emphasis on community voice and leadership. We will hear from a luminary uh, panel of speakers, really amazing speakers around the world. And to kick off our session, it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dean Rachel Kite. Rachel Kite is the 14th Dean of the Fletcher School at Tufts University. She is the first woman to lead the nation's oldest graduate school of international affairs. Prior to joining Fletcher, Dean Kite served as a special representative of the UN Secretary General and Chief Executive Officer of Sustainable Energy for All. She previously was the World Bank Group Vice President and Special Envoy for Climate Change, leading up to the run-up to the Paris Agreement. Um, Dean Kite is going to deliver our keynote address. Over to you. It's a great honor and a privilege to join you here today. Um, and uh, I see my task in, in, in kicking off this conversation uh, as one to sort of set partly a, a part of the global scenery for the extraordinary uh, scholarship and insight and leadership that is going to be uh, contained in, the, in the, the speakers in the rest of the session. This photograph is a photograph of everybody's aspiration for prosperity. For low and middle income people in most of the hot countries in the world, they have limited access to keeping themselves cool in a world which is warming quite quickly and in a world uh, where uh, the heat island effect and our patterns of urbanization and growth mean that we are trapping heat where most people are living or will live in the future. And if we don't keep inequality and inequity at the heart or the challenges to those at the heart of our climate solutions, we swerve dangerously close to a narrative where one family's search for prosperity, which means that as a low income family rising up the income ladder, as soon as you are able to afford to, you will try to find a way to a cooling solution. And in many cases, given the way we have built our cities up to now, that will be an air conditioner. You will seek that cooling solution for your family, but that air conditioner today will be a cheap one because that will be all that you can afford. And a cheap one will be polluting. It will have hydrofluorocarbons in it, which will exacerbate global heating. And it will be very energy inefficient. And so put pressure on your family budget by running uh, through your energy bill extensively. And so if we are to find solutions to inequality and inequity, to climate change, to clean air, then we need to set the problem definition differently, as was done in this case by the Global Cooling Prize uh, four years ago, where the idea was to come forward with a cooling solution, in this case, an air conditioner that could operate at five times the efficiency of anything today, sell at a price point, which would be attractive for a low income uh, Indian family. That was the set that was used in the problem definition and allow a family's search for prosperity to make them part of the solution, not part of the problem. 
But climate change, as was said by Michelle in the opening, is the greatest threat uh, that we face. And it is a uh, gray rhino. It is a threat in plain sight. We have been warned for decades. And we were warned again by scientists in August of last year. And then just a few weeks ago, we were warned again about the impacts of climate change. And then in another uh, few days, we will receive uh, another scientific study uh, from the International Panel on Climate Change looking at the mitigation strategies that will be needed. So we have been warned that the more that we pollute uh, our atmosphere with uh, carbon emissions, the more we will warm the planet, and that is within doubt. And yet we have, as a, as a society, as a set of societies, not been able to get out of the way. And we had a precursor of this in the, uh, pand mo the most recent pandemic. This was, again, something that we were warned about uh, in, in plain sight. So these are not risks which are unimaginable. These are not risks that catch us by surprise. These are ri risks that we are warned uh, about, and yet our public policy and our politics lets our science down. In the case of COVID, the monitoring board set up by the World Bank and the World Health Organization gave explicit warning, uh, talking about, uh, in one sentence, really a description of what COVID-19 turned out to be, and asked everyone, countries, donors, the, the, the rich countries that are supposed to help poorer countries, uh, multilateral development banks, the UN system, everybody prepare for the worst and yet we were caught flat-footed. What does this mean about our ability to respond to the very real and present threats and dangers of climate change, which until very recently seemed to be something that happened to somebody else over there, but now is happening to everybody right now, whether you're living in Boulder County in Colorado, or whether you're living in a small island developing state in the Pacific. We've learned a few things about COVID as well that there is within communities a, a different appreciation of resilience, that we can, um, that we understand that our resilience is undermined by deep uh, inequalities within our societies. Can that be banked? Can we turn that into something in the way in which we organize? And does that translate up the policy ladder to the federal level in this country or to the national level in other countries? We also learned that uh, many of the systems which need to be transformed in the fight against climate change, energy, the financial system, the food system, uh, were very brittle uh, and did not uh, cope well with the disruptions that came from an immediate shutdown of an economy and then rolling shutdowns, rolling uh, commodity prices, uh, uh, dislocation, etc. We also learned that everything that we have set up for the last 80 or more years since, uh, since the middle of the last century in terms of the tools of the trade of international cooperation from the World Health Organization to the United Nations system to the multilateral economic governance of the World Trade Organization, the International Monetary Fund, they, they are all creaking at the seams under the weight of the kind of transformation that we will need in order to combat climate change. And that we ignore site risks in plain sight. So just let me remind you where we are on this journey in combating climate change, because I think it puts the urgency that you will hear from other speakers very much in context. So in the last six years, seven years ago, we agreed that, and everybody agreed, right, all countries agreed that we would limit warming to well below two degrees. And the science has now made it very clear that we need to limit warming to one and a half degrees above pre-industrial levels. Now that's important because as we go through um, the twists and turns of the different kinds of transitions of changing our energy system, of changing our land use patterns, on changing our food systems, the, the food that is both poisonous to us and to the planet at the moment, uh, as we change these things, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the point on the horizon, the destination is agreed. And despite uh, the exit and then re-entry of the United States, uh, uh, everybody is still at the table. And that I think is important because it allows then progress to move forward very quickly in areas where there is leadership. And that's often in hybrid groups of governments and private sector and civil society and cities and towns coming together and moving forward on an issue despite the lack of an international agreement perhaps on the specifics of what is being talked about. And we agreed that we would keep ratcheting up our ambition 
in peri in, in a, on a periodic basis after 2015. And the first of those sort of ratchets was last year in Glasgow at the climate talks. And there, again, we saw clarity of uh, net zero uh, commitments, which is basically the balancing of your economy with uh, with the, the with planetary science by the mid mid century, but you saw specific commitments by 2030 being issued by countries everybody uh, from from India through to of course uh, China to the United States European Union, but you know most countries coming forward with clear plans or at least intentions. So now we move from stating the ambition to actually implementing uh, the actions that are necessary, and this is where it gets much more complicated, and this is where we have reason to be quite. Uh, concerned about our, our lack of speed and progress. But I also want to just put out there that it's really only since 2006 that we've understood climate change as an economic issue. It was uh, something that environmental uh, diplomats discussed. It was an issue of climate science, but this was not understood as an, ec an economic issue. And Lord Nick Stern in 2006, when he produced the Stern report, which was the first report that really explored all of this, stated very clearly at the time that the cost of inaction would far outweigh the cost of action. And that was a clarion call to policymakers, economic policymakers. The extent to which that has been internalized or not in our, in our economic systems, in our tax base, in our energy systems, in transportation systems, in health systems, is I think a, a major question for now. And if not, then why not? And following on the back of that, the financial system has since 2015 really started to get its head around, well, if we um, need to decarbonize our economy in order to meet our commitments to uh, a 1.5 degree world, if we need less fossil fuels, and if we burn fossil fuels, then we must make sure that none of their emissions go up into the atmosphere because it is producing climate change as well as, of course, paralyzing the health of, of, many, of many of us as humans, but also other species in poor air quality. Then if we understand that, then we should take a view of the risk associated with holding carbon assets. And this has led to a divestment movement on the one hand, where you see uh, public pension funds and long-term investors indicating that they don't want to be holding carbon assets because there's no return to be expected from those investments. They will be stranded assets. But you also see um, a, a, a large pivot away in the financial sector beyond just divestment to asking questions and wanting to have a sense of the risk of a company if it doesn't know how it is going to continue to make profit or continue to operate in a world where carbon is no longer the lifeblood of our economies. And this has floated through all the way through the economic system now, and it is a subject of, of, of urgent review. And you will have seen some of you that last week, the, the Securities Exchange Commission put forward for the first time in the United States, draft uh, rules for how companies in this country should behave in terms of understanding and being uh, transparent about their risk of, of the carbon intensity of their activity. Um, but as will be, I think, throughout the whole of this discussion, the impacts of climate change don't fall equally, just as the impacts of the pandemic don't, didn't fall equally. They fall on those who are most vulnerable. And those are the most vulnerable within societies. And they are also the most vulnerable globally. And I put this, uh, this the graphic here from the Economic Commission, a UN Economic Commission on Africa, that basically shows that the loss of, uh, to, loss of GDP, so loss of wealth, uh, to climate change by 2030 will be more intense in the number of sub-Saharan African countries. And these are the countries that are already experiencing extraordinary economic dislocation as a result of commodity uh, price shifts as a result of COVID. They are also countries that were already experiencing low growth and they were already then experiencing a debt distress and liquidity stress as a result of the economic dislocation of the last uh, few years. So some of the most vulnerable countries are facing the largest impacts as a result of climate change. And this brings up to the very top of the way in which we deal with each other as countries and as citizens of the world, the question of justice. Because this is a colonial footprint that we have left around the world 
It is in the pursuit of an extraction of resources that the developed world uh, uh, enriched itself, the developed world that used fossil fuels, the developed world that has got us to the brink of this crisis of climate change. And uh, our environmental justice, our climate justice is a call for a re-embracing of, or a, a reframing of what it means to be in solidarity with each other. And if that word doesn't work, if it, that smacks too, uh, too European, too socialist, then we should find some other way of understanding what our commitment should be to sisters and brothers around the world. And just, uh, some, 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 just some numbers around this inaction being higher than action, because this is the question which comes to the justice at home as well as the justice between countries. So we, we know that we are already now paying extraordinary amounts uh, for the impacts of the cl of climate change being experienced right now. So insurance costs uh, for 2020, uh, around about 100 billion in this country alone, uh, even higher last year, uh, I think the number that I've seen is 180 billion, but that is really only for certain extreme weather events. And I think we don't yet have systems that capture all of the costs, that, especially the invisible costs of a community absorbing people because they're moving from a neighboring community because the flood risk is too high or because they can't get insured or because there's been a fire that's just come through there twice in the last 12 months. We haven't yet fully found a way to measure these costs. But we also see uh, that the costs accrue um, uh, to, as I said, to African countries where basically the cost of adaptation to something that they did not cause will be uh, at least uh, $5 uh, per person. Per, and this is a, an extraordinary uh, uh, impact on, on, on the way we think about uh, the way we think about the economic path forward for, for poor countries. And then I think just, just to say that it isn't the question that, of whether we can afford it or not. It's whether or not in the system we are prepared to um, do the, the, the smart thing, get out of the way of the white rhino. So are we prepared to uh, redirect subsidies which are going, uh, harmful subsidies going to fossil fuels and redirect them so that people on low income, especially, and, and that will, and especially communities uh, which are, are often beyond the reach. So communities of color on low income that they are getting access to uh, support for clean energy uh, but we're not using fossil fuel subsidies to subsidize a middleman or a producer in order to keep uh, to keep producing. And that works globally as well. Then uh, also, can we move farm subsidies, harmful farm subsidies, uh, where we're producing uh, just a, a high concentration of a few staples? And could you actually find a way to subsidize people so that they can eat a healthy diet, which is produced sustainably? And you start to see that, for example, the experimentations of health insurance companies in paying people to eat uh, a, a healthy diet uh, as a way to prevent them from uh, drawing down on the healthcare system later. So we have to just shift the way that we think uh, about the fact that our resilience and our inequality and inequity will stand us in better stead to face this extraordinary existential threat of climate change. But that hasn't floated through and it hasn't floated through even when it comes to the areas where perhaps it's the most clear. So there's been extraordinary work done on clean air, extraordinary work done on what that means in, in morbidity and mortality, what it means for the economic productivity of cities and neighborhoods, um, and, uh, and that that's a rising issue in the crowded and, and fast growing cities of the developing world. And yet still in our overseas development assistance, so this is the money that rich countries send uh, in, in aid and development to, to lower income countries, even there, our official development assistance is channeling more money into projects that prolong fossil fuel than actually promote air quality. So we, even when we know uh, with, with quite certainty that the, the detail of the inequality in our climate action and our, our need to react differently, we're not quite moving fast enough. And so I'll leave you here uh, with just some implications. Before COVID, and before we understood the climate impacts of the last two years, which have been extreme and are going to get worse every year, the International Monetary Fund said that the uh, lack of inclusion within the economies today was perhaps one of the most corrosive elements of economic policy that we had to deal with. You know, in, in equal societies are not resilient. And so uh, we have to deal with uh, that in, in our shift to a greener, cleaner economy. Uh, we, we, that the, the leaving no one behind is as important as the emissions reduction. 
urgency, we have very little time. We have to cut 45% of all emissions this decade. And uh, we are now distracted by a war born of fossil fuels. Uh, and this is going to make uh, policy making even more uh, complex. We are talking about systems changes. Uh, yes, each one of us needs to behave in a different way where we have choices and where we have uh, capability and agency, but we're talking about systems change, uh, assist systems which have not counted the cost of the social impacts uh, of their use. So the fact that we, we, the fact that we have economic measures from GDP on that don't really internalize the human cost or the planetary cost of their operation. Um, nothing can be solved by us alone. We will need a new era of international cooperation. And uh, we have broken equality value chains. So that some of the most powerful voices arguing for a change are women in poor communities, uh, in marginalized communities uh, around the world. And some of the most inventive solutions for how we can come together to work differently and build social equity and trust within communities to make them more resilient are coming from those communities and particular women within them. And yet when we get to the very top of the international negotiations and the value chains, we see boardrooms heavily, depend, uh, heavily uh, 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 male dominated. Uh, we see uh, a lack of other forms of uh, equality represented in our cabinets, in our elected parliaments and in our boardrooms. And so at some point, um, that age old question of who's in the room and whose agency can be tapped into will become, uh, is already and should become more and more uh, uh, an issue for concern. Um, and more and more of the uh, support, whether it's governmental or philanthropic or in other forms, has to get into the hands of the people who can see the gray rhino right in front of them and have plenty of ideas about how to get out of the way. They just don't have the means. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Kite. Um, that was a wonderful keynote. And I noticed that there are many questions that are coming up and please keep putting them into the chat and we'll get to them later. Um, the next speaker is Noeline Nambulivo. And she is a feminist organizer, activist, advocate, and policy ana analyst from Fiji. For over 35 years, Noeline has worked to affirm and protect universal human rights and advance transformative linked approaches to gender, social economic, ecological, and climate justice. She is the co founder and executive director of Diverse Voices in Action, DIVA, I love that, for equality a Fijian feminist collective and network led by lesbian, bisexual, transmasculine, and gender diverse people that concentrates work in urban poor communities, rural and maritime constituencies of Fiji, linking work to other Pacific small island states and large ocean states. Noeline will present on climate preparedness and extreme weather from a community perspective. Noeline, over to you. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, um, Michelle. And thanks, Rachel. It's not often I have someone who, who lays out a really wonderful um, meta um, view of the world for us before I get to speak. So thanks very much. Um, I will just set up my PowerPoint. Um, so basically, uh, yes, I'm going to try and very quickly in 10 minutes talk about climate preparedness work and response. Um, and what I really wanted to do was mainly three things. One is, you know, talk about some of those complex issues um, and how the climate um, links to the work that we're doing on um, socioeconomic and ecological justice, and particularly anything that comes up around health. Um, and, and not just the complexity, but how then are communities dealing with that in my particular context. Um, and I'd, I'd love to have a broader um, discussion um, later about uh, other communities around the world as well. And then some key areas um, in which we're trying to extend our own work, but also, um, you know, that we're working out with other social movements on, on what are the challenges that lie ahead. And I just wanted to very quickly start with context to say that um, I'm from a small island state um, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean that covers a quarter um, of the Earth's um, uh, area, um, and that we still have some of the world's um, remaining colonial territories. So, for instance, we have West Papua, 
um, that really has been going through a genocide for the last 60 years. And so there's a real, um, um, a real variant in terms of um, the, the small island states that we have in the Pacific. There's 20, 22 island states and communities actually, um, not 20. Um, then uh, I, I also always try and show that, you know, when I'm speaking, it comes from um, a, a really broad set of social movement work um, and that more and more what we're finding is we're working with both the ones that you would expect, feminist groups and uh, LGBTQI organizations, uh, but also in terms of climate and ecological justice, economic justice groups, um, and broadly with uh, disability-led um, movements um, and, and others both in the Pacific, but then uh, globally. And it really is the strength of um, social movements. Um, before I get into this discussion um, about uh, hazards, I think, uh, let me just put that back to that for a second, because I, I really wanted to start and say, um, for me, you know, I work with women across um, Fiji and the Pacific and globally. I'm part of um, Diva for Equality for the past um, 10 years, but really 35 years of this work. And it's only a, a, you know, early March now, and there's so many people in Fiji who are already exhausted, some more than others, and particularly women. Um, in just one month in January um, this year, we had around three to four weeks of heavy rain in Nandi here in Fiji. And so flooding of thousands of houses more than once, experienced a cyclone passing through um, and two tropical disturbances that passed by us, which then also brought more flooding. Um, there was a volcano eruption in Tonga that took over both um, our lives and the whole of the population of Tonga, um, a huge kind of um, mass movement of people trying to get urgent help but also around issues of psychosocial and mental health the temperature rise is happening globally obviously but our water and electricity systems are failing um, there's many many brownouts and blackouts and a poor woman in a maritime island area and a poor woman in an informal settlement in Suva, they don't maybe have the exact same problems but both matter both are rights bearers um, and I often think about the fact that, you know, we can have all these endless debates about how we um, define poverty, but if you can't fulfill the basic needs for yourself and your family, you're not queer, quibbling about whether you're poor by income standard or by lack of opportunity, you're poor, it hurts, and you're trying to feed your family. For poor people, which are 99% of my constituent um, network in Diva for Equality, there's really now very little way um, to be sufficiently resilient to withstand the loss and damage of um, over and over. It's an assault on our bodies and on our communities, um, and we have had to prepare, and we are. But Excuse me, while no. Yes, yes. Um, sorry. You're not, your slides are not being shared, and you don't need them because you're so eloquent. No. But you might want to share your slides. Yes, I, I will in a second. I'll just tell this little story, and then I'm back on. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah. You're welcome. Um, meanwhile, malnutrition's rising uh, and Diva with other NGOs and government ministries are struggling every day to fill the growing need. Um, things like fellow staff, my own staff who can't um, come to work um, as flooding stops us from moving from office to home and back. There's shop stock that gets ruined, um, people postponing all kinds of family rituals like weddings, bodies sit in morgues often waiting for a dry day to bury a child or an older person. Um, and after three days, um, the morgue starts to charge. So there are economic um, issues that then come in. Children who are waiting um, weeks and weeks and, and now a couple of years to enter school, um, Fiji Women's Crisis Centre tells us that already our sky high gender based violence figures are up again. Nurses are reporting being tormented by their husbands because they're long hours away um, on COVID-19 work shifts. Um, they're in often patriarchal homes with the highest uh, two to three times the care work that's being done by women in the home. Um, and then children being unsupervised in many, many homes because Parents are having to go out to find casual work because we're now about 50% of the population um, that have been unemployed for a couple of years now because our borders were closed. Um, so, and the last thing I'd say is, for instance, an older LBT woman can't move from her small rental by a riverbank because she's locked in there by inability to afford even the next rank um, of, of rentals. The poverty is generational, so her own family can't help. 
She's, she cleans her possessions every few weeks, every time they get flooded. Um, and, and so we're trying to do the work to assist. And that's why I really wanted to kind of start with that, because when we, when we talk about it, often it, it, uh, the reason why we use an intersectional and interlinkage approach is to bring out the fact that all of these are lived within our bodies, which is where we carry our human rights, right? Um, so when we talk about the issues of Pacific hazards, yes, we're talking about the cyclones, the drought, the lands, uh, landslides, the floods. Yes, we're talking about, you know, the volcanic eruptions and earthquakes and tsunamis. But every day, every year, um, Pacific countries are now dealing usually with an ongoing uh, crisis in terms of a major disaster and then also recovering from one that has been there. So there are limits to adaptation. And that's where we um, are speaking about the language of loss and damage. There are increases in temperature and heat distress and flooding, contaminated water and food supplies. So some of the issues that have been um, talked about within our region, and this is just from a um, WHO study, is around not just the physical um, things that we're dealing with, but trauma, um, psychosocial issues, um, respiratory diseases, there are also impacts on what food is available in for poor families as Rachel has raised, compromised um, safety and security of, um, of water and food. Then there's vector-borne diseases, waterborne diseases, zoonosis as we all know, um, and the population pressures and health system deficiencies. Okay, so what we already know then, um, and I'm really conscious of time, so I apologize if I go very fast through these. Obviously, we have the right to a clean and feminist add in safe, healthy and sustainable environment. And we have this wonderful resolution that's just been passed. Um, it's amazing it took so long, right? But the Human Rights um, Council, uh, uh, the 48th Commission. Then um, we have we have to take care in terms of our definitions and narratives and and one of the things that we're speaking a lot about is about climate justice. How are we linking development and human rights to achieve a rights based approach to climate change as being the minimum conditions for a dignified life, um, both within our own countries, but also. Um, uh, 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 within the global uh, multilateral system. Taking care and clarity on the urgency and the level of crisis. So for instance, one of the things we have to talk about is about climate lapse. It's about the time between the emissions level and the effects that show up in the global temperature rise and conditions, because it's a couple of years before we start to see that anyway. So there is that lag. Um, uh, uh, from from what we're where we are today in terms of temperature rise and, and what the actual reality is that we will be experiencing in coming years. Also, in this rapidly you know closing window for change, what is the language we use for the change? Is it still the just transitions that we fought so hard and are still to get into language and text, or is it urgent just shifts? How fast is going to be fast enough? And we know it's incredibly fast. Um, so what we're talking about is drastically re reducing emissions, and that means we're not talking about and, and you know Rachel I'd really love to have a conversation about this in terms of you know what do we do about the fact that so many are trying still to do the carbon trading. Um, it, is it about the debt for climate swaps and all of these very clever technical um, fixes because we know we have to decarbonize um, and how do we move that political will to get there. Because adaptation is not just about the act of resilience, but it's about all of those conditions that we require um, without which adaptation is impossible. And I tried to kind of share some of that in my story. And then this, you know, we've been fighting in every single COP for the language around loss and damage. And that's way beyond adaptation because it's about justice. It's about historical emissions. Um, and that's why industrial countries are actively opposed. But beyond that, what is the shift then um, that will take us into where we need to be, both in terms of finance, but also in terms of the shifts that we need to do, um, both in multilateral relationships, um, structural change to our economic systems, but also at a national and a local level, how are we going to make those changes changes in economic policy in our own countries. And as you all know, how are we going to do that in terms of health and education and all those other must haves that we require. So part of that is about localization and about multiple forms of knowledge on climate and disaster response. But beyond talking about that, how do you make that happen? 
what is it that we need to, to change in the way that we configure development and in the way that we make sure that health, um, healthy ecosystems are possible. Because we know that we have to keep our healthy ecosystems um, um, in, in good shape, not just because it's the right thing, but they provide that life critical services that we re require. So that means we have to be talking about the rewilding. Um, and we have a lot of good work, things like the 30 by 30 by 30 uh, by 2030, but it's also around 100% of our degraded ecosystems and the ecosphere um, being, being looked after. We, so we talk about um, defending the commons, that which is required for the living planet, air, waterways, ocean, soil, biodiversity, and connecting that to human systems. So talking about things like the social floor and social protection, social and physical infrastructure, um, transport, progressive economic um, justice policies and practice. And these might include things like centering um, the question of unpaid care domestic and in the Pacific, we also talk about communal work um, because so much of our, not just our economies, but our entire societies are built on the backs of um, backbreaking work by, by women and girls. Um, and, and that is about tackling patriarchy. And that is about showing how that is part of climate uh, crisis realities for women and girls in my own family and community, but also throughout the world. It is about gender division of labor and its role in historical and structural inequalities and how that then plays out within um, where we find ourselves today. There's material and structural change that's required. So that is about redistribution. That is about things, as Rachel said, like unconditional and conditional cash transfers. Um, it's about work to end violence against women and girls. And we're doing a lot of work on making sure that the humanitarian systems, uh, response systems, uh, the disaster response systems are also that set of work that we have been doing for decades around um, stopping this absolute epid epidemic of violence against women and girls. Um, access of women and girls to uh, sexual reproductive health and rights, including menstrual justice, emergency contraception, right to abortion, but also especially in times of climate just injustice and high loss and damage, what are the things that we require even more of in order to be able to put into place our frontline protocols and make sure that they're operating from the capital through to rural and maritime areas, if you're talking about ours and others around the world. Securing you, the rights of women. Sorry, I think we're thank about you, there, are we? Yeah. Yeah. Would you like me to close off? Yep. Okay. Please, so, please. so I will just literally show you that these are some of the sets of work um, that we've been doing for the last 10 to 15 years, um, that it is about building base and organizing, that it is about more than that, about making sure that we're providing access to commodities, but also helping women to be um, to be seen and to be heard practically from local to global. And that's why I'm here as well, um, is to make sure that we're directly speaking to all of you who are doing your wonderful work on global health. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nolene. I know this is very short periods, but we have some wonderful other speakers. Um, I would like to um, introduce Delhi Ogunsetan, who is Professor of Public Health at the University of California at Irvine. He holds the presidential chair and serves as the founding chair of the Department of Population Health and Disease Prevention there. He's also an alumni faculty fellow at the International School International Affairs at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. And he researches the nexus of industrial development, environmental quality, and human health. Delhi will present on pollution, environmental justice, and e-waste from a global perspective. Um, Dr. Ogan Senten, over to you, Delhi. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, it's a great honor to be here with this distinguished panel. I think one of the things that run across all these uh, issues are uh, the undervaluing of materials that we extract uh, from the planet. Uh, petroleum uh, certainly has been undervalued for uh, at least the last uh, two centuries, and I think we're paying the price now. And what I'm going to talk about is a little uh, corner of um, uh, extraction that uh, we uh, also undervaluing and um, exacting a major toll on people across the planet. 
uh, it is about uh, justice and how we make sure uh, that uh, going forward, we take lessons, uh, whether it's from climate change and other uh, environmental issues and really implement them uh, to avoid uh, regrettable uh, solutions. So I will talk uh, very briefly about uh, my work and the work of a lot of my colleagues on, on electronic waste. And since we only have a brief period of time, I want to uh, really uh, talk about the key points and uh, hopefully we'll have time to, uh, to discuss them. As you heard from, from Noeling, there are so many interconnected issues too many children and women and underemployed men uh, risk their health uh, through uh, labor in artisanal mining, exposing the environment and the population to hazardous uh, chemicals. Some of the technical solutions uh, that are being proposed have not kept up with the scale of the problem, addressing uh, populations that are at most risk. And then we do have uh, policy solutions that do not uh, integrate very well uh, to balance the need for labor uh, with the safety uh, that's essential. Uh, we also have uh, the rudiments of grassroots community level advocacy. Uh, you've heard some of them today, but we need to uh, really better integrate this with the communication of uncertainty that we may have in some of the scientific models and the technologies, and everybody brings their own experts to this debate, and sometimes we speak uh, past one another. The environmental justice agenda for e-waste really needs to cut across uh, the uh, entire life cycle of materials and products, taking into consideration uh, the people at each of those stages. I think we've missed that point uh, for some time. And finally, uh, I've learned a lot from my colleagues who are working in this field on the need for situational and inclusive justice. When we speak of environmental justice, we tend to uh, really paint with a broad brush, but uh, there's usually a long history uh, behind uh, the uh, headlines that we see, and we need to put the right context uh, to be more inclusive. So let me now go through uh, some of these points very briefly. Some of you may have seen uh, that uh, in 2019, the international rights advocates uh, sued Apple, Google, Dell, uh, Tesla, uh, about Congolese uh, children uh, being maimed and dying uh, from the mines uh, in Congo for cobalt. Uh, this is uh, just the tip of the iceberg, uh, but it is a headline uh, story. Uh, the uh, phones and the computers that I'm speaking to you through now all need cobalt to work. The, uh, as we transition from petroleum to electric vehicles, uh, the batteries need cobalt to work. So we are moving from petroleum to resources that are potentially uh, also just as problematic. Uh, the work uh, behind this lawsuit was uh, done in part by Siddharth Kara, uh, who visited my campus not too long ago, uh, but it's on behalf of 14 families and the injured children. So this is at the beginning of the life cycle uh, of the materials. Uh, at the end of that cycle, uh, WHO published their report uh, just about uh, less than a year ago uh, really uh, documenting that, uh, as I mentioned, too many children are at risk uh, managing the waste that we produce uh, from uh, our phones and computers and, and gadgets. Uh, we recycle less than 20%, and that's a, a global figure. In the U.S., it's actually close to about 15%, uh, despite decades of warning that this is a very dangerous uh, situation. Uh, almost 13 million women and 18 million uh, children uh, walk uh, in dumps, uh, recycle, trying to recover small amounts of e-waste. Uh, in the preface to that article, to that uh, publication, Tedros, the director of WHO, called it a tsunami of e-waste. And when you visit uh, some of these uh, sites, 
uh, it looks innocuous enough, except when you start looking uh, into health outcomes and uh, lead in the blood and all kinds of uh, exposures and reproductive issues uh, that uh, will cut the lives of people short and make the healthcare system uh, overvalued. It's not easy to come up with a simple solution because we know people need the work. Uh, so the International Labor Organization has weighed, weighed in on this. There are lots of resistance to international movement of uh, potentially recyclable materials or refurbishable materials or donations from humanitarian needs. Uh, but how do we make it so that we're not uh, uh, burdening uh, the recipient societies with, with a lot of uh, waste uh, that is not good for their health? And we've done a little bit of work and I'm just gonna share uh, this for referencing. Uh, my, my former student, Kathleen Hibbert, who now works for EPA, really reproduced the kinds of hazards that are associated with burning uh, e-waste to recover small amounts of copper or gold and the ash that remains, it's, it's to toxic. We, we do have models to think about how many cases of cancer or non-cancer diseases or water pollution that might result uh, from such practices. And it's been documented very nicely in the field. Uh, uh, technical solutions on the left here is a million dollar robot that Apple uh, created that can take apart your cell phone uh, in five minutes or less. Uh, we, we can't scale this to places. Uh, I took these pictures in Ghana, uh, B and C, and in China, D and E, uh, where we're stockpiling and really doing manual labor. Uh, so we have the resources to create these kinds of robots, but we are not able to uh, scale them down to help those who uh, need the jobs. And that's one of the challenges uh, on technology. Uh, at the policy level, we do have the Basel Convention, for example, and we wrote about this many years ago, that without the local policies to encourage recycling and recovering uh, and transportation of these materials, uh, we will not be able to make a dent. And we're now seeing the outcome of that policy uh, failure, uh, in my view. Uh, and for example, uh, in the U.S., we've shown uh, nationally that each one of us uh, has about six units of electronic products that we are not able to uh, uh, dispose of properly. And when we are pushed, we simply put them in the domestic bin and don't pay attention to where they end up. Uh, some of these solutions are not well integrated with the technical uh, solutions that we have. And we've talked about using uh, uh, blockchain, for example, uh, the resistance of uh, corporations to have third party repair uh, products so that they last longer. Uh, it, we see that opening up, but it's still a long road uh, to get uh, that connection uh, so that people can share profits. Uh, so these are references for those who want to follow up and we can discuss uh, more later. At the community level, uh, as I mentioned, everybody brings their experts. I think we have a, a challenge. This is a very interesting uh, book by Gwen Ottinger and Benjamin uh, Cohen uh, about the role of experts uh, sitting in academic institutions, uh, really doing community engagement. And we need to think about this, uh, not just for uh, e-waste, but I think this is a lesson for uh, uh, solutions to uh, climate change, even at the local uh, level, uh, as we think about these geotechnical solutions that may not sit well uh, with communities. Uh, and some of the policies uh, we have to communicate uncertainty better. Uh, this was an article that we uh, wrote uh, a, a while back saying that the Basel Convention, we don't have to get 100% uh, evidence that something is hazardous, uh, that the cause of a particular cancer is uh, only e-waste and only e-waste, but that we can make some uh, solutions regardless of that. So uh, just in closing, I wanted to uh, show that the, there are so many, many multi-billion dollar transnational corporations engaged. Uh, 
uh, to move from mining uh, natural uh, resources to manufacturing to our consuming behavior to the disposal of waste, uh, the solutions have to cut across these domains. Uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, working with communities, I learned a lot from my colleagues, uh, Grace and Peter, and they wrote this book uh, uh, about their anthropo anthropologists, and they wrote this book uh, at the site that I also uh, worked in in Ghana. Uh, and visited and uh, really talked to those who uh, put the problem of e-waste in, in the notorious market in a long history of migration, uh, of uh, underemployment of young men uh, and a lot of children that are not in school where they should be. And uh, the solutions that we're coming up with uh, really need to be uh, from the grassroots level. And they really, taught me a lot about what situated justice is, and we cannot put a uh, one brush uh, uh, solution across all communities. So finally, I just wanna uh, conclude by uh, noting that inclusive justice demands engaging industries. Uh, we have to work with them, not through lawyers. Uh, we have to empower safe mining because people need the jobs. Uh, and and uh, it's up to us as individuals to be able to uh, do our part in uh, product recovery and recycling and uh, lots of opportunities uh, to engage uh, experts uh, and also uh, uh, working across uh, national boundaries through the United Nations instruments uh, for uh, monitoring uh, transboundary movement of hazardous waste. So thank you very much. I hope I didn't go over too much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Deli. We look forward to having you on Stanford's campus as a visiting scholar next year. I look forward to it. Thank you. Um, the next person speaking is Deborah McGregor. Uh, Professor McGregor works at York University's Osgoode Hall Law School in Canada, where she is a cross appointee with the Faculty of Environmental Studies and Urban Change. Professor McGregor's research has focused on indigenous knowledge systems and their various applications in diverse contexts of environmental justice. Her research relates to indigenous knowledge systems, governance, and sustainability. Today, she will be presenting on environmental impacts from an indigenous perspective and through an equity lens. Dr. McGregor, Deborah. Thank you for having me and thank you for the uh, presenters um, ahead of me, you make my job a little bit easier. So I appreciate your, your comments and insights. So I'm going to be um, sharing screen. It'll just keep me on track. Cause as you can, as you know, so many people here on this panel are, are so expert in their areas that we could talk for a very long time. And I wanna make sure that there's space um, for, for others. So first, um, I, I do wanna thank you for having me. I'm just thrilled. I'm learning so much, uh, like my code word of the day is just get out of our way. Like just let, let's, let us do our thing. And I, I think we'll be, uh, um, I think we can probably get there. So just for a little bit of background, a couple initiatives that I'm heavily involved in in the Canadian context. And right now I'm, I'm sitting in Toronto. So greetings to wherever people are in whatever time zones that they happen to be in is, um, working with uh, folks on developing Canada's first health strategy, national health strategy, and as part of Climate Science 250, also trying to figure out how we can work towards um, health adaptation and what kind of research needs to happen to support, um, as, as speakers before I pointed out, sometimes we're, we're moving too fast and, and the, the science and the research hasn't caught up to some of the challenges to fully um, understand it. So we're so those are some of the more recent initiatives, literally last week on those panels. Um, so hopefully maybe later on when there's time for dialogue, we can talk about that. I'm gonna time myself here just to make sure that I um, don't run over time. So I always like to start off with the slide. I'm not gonna read it. Like really my main message here is to think about indigenous peoples as being societies and nations. Um, and I'm not saying we're not populations, we're not vulnerable, we're not at risk, all those labels that go along with Indigenous peoples in, in the climate change dialogue, especially internationally, but that we're also nations, which means that we would like to be able to address um, 
climate change on, on our terms as well. Of course, there needs to be cooperation at every level, but we want to be able to self-determine a lot of our own solutions um, in relation to the, to the work that we do. Um, we also have our own conceptions of justice based on our own governance and laws, uh, which is a lot of what I focus on um, in my research. Um, and I'm, I'm not saying that we're perfect, even though we had, we had knowledge systems to deal with whatever challenges that we were facing, but we did deal with, with challenges and we, and we had processes for how we would deal with those, including sometimes in our stories facing our destruction. And that usually had to do with human, humans, people's inappropriate relations with the rest of uh, what, what I would say the rest of creation or the natural world um, or the planet, which we had very um, broader concepts of what that is, including the sun, the moon, the stars. And um, so usually uh, what that means is we develop then our own processes for how we would try to correct that balance for how we would try to move back into um, harmony. So um, I call these the disaster reports. Rachel talked about these. <laughs> Every report that comes out is pointing to a worse and worse situation. So clearly the, the current status quo for how um, climate change is being um, diagnosed and the solutions or the inappropriate solutions, I suppose, in some cases being put forward, um, they're not working. Or in the case of the way in some of the work that I do, sometimes some of the solutions being put forward can actually create further injustice and inequity, um, as others have pointed, uh, pointed out. But what I do want to say about these um, disaster reports and a number of them come out all the time, some of them dealing with biodiversity and, and other issues, as they all call for transformation. What does that look like? Like what kind of transformation do we need to have in order to move to um, a just and equitable future in terms of, or any kind of climate future actually, um, that's gonna be um, equitable. So living well, um, this is how I understand planetary health is living well means realizing our responsibilities to each other and to the earth itself. Um, and in indigenous, and I'll speak from an Anishinaabe perspective because I can't speak on behalf of other indigenous peoples. Um, I'm in Anishinaabe from Great Lakes area, uh, crossing the border, which really wasn't our idea as Anishinaabe people, um, that we had our own conceptions of what this would look like, uh, encompassed within this concept of Mininamadzuin, to live well, and to live well extended out to the natural world. Uh, and to our ancestors um, and to future generations. So we have a framework for what this should look like. And um, that the other part of it that I wanted to mention is that, um, that, that I've become rather fixated on recently and it's guiding a lot of the future research that I'm doing is um, some of the, the work that's emerging out of the United Nations and, and other places. And I can say this also true in the Canadian context that um, we're, Indigenous peoples caretake, I'll say, about 20% of the world's um, land mass, and that's where 80% of the biodiversity is found. And also that's where Indigenous languages are spoken. So there's this connection that's starting to be explored. Now this is already known in Indigenous communities, but now other people are starting to understand, um, understand this reality. And in the Canadian context where you find most species at, at risk, those species still that are on the list where they're still living and flourishing tend to be in First Nation um, First Nation communities. So there, so Indigenous peoples know some things. <laughs> As opposed to just being, you know, problems to be solved, we can actually contribute to moving towards um, solutions. So in these climate change circles that I find myself in, I'm also part of a think tank on climate solutions. Is a, there's always a reluctance, and other speakers have talked about this here on this panel, to acknowledge colonialism as being part of the problem. And that's part of our reality. Um, in Canada, United States, no doubt elsewhere in the world. Those are usually when I'm having to write about this as part of climate assessments, it's Canada, um, Canada, US. And what this means is it hasn't gone away. It's historical, but it's also ongoing. And it really limits indigenous people's ability to be able to respond to climate change in the way that they would like. Um, Cause a lot of these laws and processes um, are still in place. Um, these have also contributed to ongoing um, health and wellness disparities in Indigenous communities. So almost every single indicator of well-being, Indigenous peoples fall behind the Canadian population. So you're already starting from this place of disadvantage. You've got this major um, challenge. Well, it's already here and Indigenous peoples and others were feeling it before everybody else. Uh, and then you have the, these systems in place 
uh, limit your ability to be able to respond in the way that you would like. Some of my um, assumptions, this was already pointed out by Noel, there's um, human and Indigenous rights concerns um, in relation to um, Indigenous peoples. And I think probably one of the, the main points I, I wanted to make here um, is that Indigenous peoples don't experience climate change in silos. So there's a certain way that, that um, the disaster reports and others report on what's happening in relation to climate change um, and, and humans, but it's very siloed. So there's mitigation, there's adaptation, there's monitoring, there's risk assessment, vulnerability, but that's not how people experience it in their everyday, um, in their everyday lives. And so sometimes those siloed um, approaches to climate change don't necessarily um, result in solutions that are going to work for everyone because they're not actually recognizing the lived reality. And others have um, spoken about this as well. It also points to what then what we consider to be um, solutions or approaches towards um, solutions. Just check time. So, so we know this at every level, Indigenous societies are more vulnerable, and a lot of this has to do with the connection to the land. <laughs> so the, the land, um, when the changes are happening to the environment, to the land, to the natural world, it impacts the, the, the everyday lived reality of Indigenous peoples who still, many still live very much um, close to the land in terms of um, food, water security, um, mental health. And, but also Indigenous societies have also adapted and survived. Part of this colonial history was mass um, relocation for Indigenous peoples. We've had to face our annihilation, like literally policies that were intended to um, exterminate Indigenous peoples. Or in Canada, we've had recent reports come out that spoke to cultural genocide, but here we are. So we've, we've learned to survive major catastrophic um, change, economic, social, cultural um, in our lives. And, and we had ways that we approach those um, approach those questions. And a lot of them had to do with um, land-based language retention, identity. Um, so there's this tension that now exists um, that I'm finding where your relationship to the land is severely impacted by climate change, but you need to have that relationship to the land in order to be able to um, survive and, and flourish into the future. So, so <laughs> trying to figure out that ongoing tension um, in the Canadian context speaks to larger movements around land defense and um, land back and other kind of um, movements that I can speak about later. Um, as I mentioned, other people's solutions, and again, I'm speaking specifically to the Canadian context, there's been lots of commissions on the problem with Indigenous peoples. Um, and usually other people's solutions don't work out that well for us. What's enabled us to survive is our own knowledge, our own language, and our own, um, our own systems. And this is just a shot, like this time of year right now with my family, we're in what we call the sugar bush, we're making maple syrup. Um, if I wasn't in Toronto and having to teach for the next couple of weeks, I'd be chomping at the butt, waiting to get out into, uh, um, waiting to get out into the bush. But what the other point I wanted to make here is that there, there's inequity and injustice in terms of what's happening to um, certain groups of people as other, others have pointed out um, prior to me, but also whose knowledge counts. Um, in assessments, in diagnosing the problem, in determining what the solutions are. Um, so there's inequity there as well. Indigenous knowledge systems not taking um, not taken seriously in a lot of these um, contexts and conversations. And I find this in my own work as, as I continue my advocacy in a lot of these um, spaces that I find myself in. So here I'm just drawing on some work that I did with some elders and youth on climate change. Um, we're, we're very visionary people in Anishinaabek, so we're trying, we, we look at the situation and we're trying to figure out how can, we, how can we still be who we are into the future in light of what we're facing. Um, and I refer to these sometimes as self-determined um, climate futures. What do they look like? What are we going to base our solutions on? And, um, and I wanted to, to just point out that I find in a lot of the Indigenous circles that I'm in, um, love comes up as a guiding principle. Do we love future generations? Do we love the earth? Like, that, that's actually one of our teachings of the seven grandfathers that guides how our decision-making um, came, uh, came up from the youth, like they were able to, to use art as a way to um, express themselves. So we're trying to figure out um, what our relationship is um, and what that should look like and how we're gonna reconnect and maintain this relationship with what's often referred to um, as mother earth. A lot of this has to do with our identity um, and languages I pointed out before, it was, our own, it was our own ways that enable us to be able to survive. Other solutions 
sometimes create, um, create more problems um, in Indigenous uh, communities. But again, there's this, there, there's this tension that we're having to, um, we're trying to figure out and negotiate. But ideally, you know, we'd like to be able to, to do this on our own terms as, as we move towards these movements towards what Indigenous-led research look like. What are our questions that we would like to, um, that we would like to answer in the challenges um, that we're facing? And this means also looking at our governance systems, our legal systems, and our knowledge systems, and how these our economic systems and how they help us um, maintain Mininawadzuin with the uh, with the rest of the earth. So um, I end here. So I know I'm throwing a lot out at you. <laughs> is some of the questions that we ask ourselves are future. So actually, this is a picture of my two year old niece uh, working in the working in the sugar bush. And um, so we're always thinking about future generations. And where I come from, if you wanna do research in our communities, you have to answer this question around love. You have to show how your research is gonna show love for future generations. So how, how do we love future generations? How will our work benefit future generations? What kind of ancestor are we gonna be? So we're having to account for that um, to our ancestors um, and to future generations. And to me, this ties into our ideas about what planetary health looks like. Everything is about maintaining that balance um, and appropriate and reciprocal relationships um, relationships with the earth. So we think about that we're descendants and we're also gonna be um, ancestors. And I think that we would have very different kinds of, of questions um, if we were enabled and facilitated to be, able to, um, to be able to answer them. So hopefully this is at least food for thought, very high level. I'm happy to have conversations um, later, but there's more for you to look forward to. So give me a question for your time. And again, look forward to chatting with you further. Thank you, Deborah. Um, again, questions should go in chat and we'll have some time at the end. Um, I'd like to introduce now Dr. Carrie Nadeau, who is the Natasi Foundation Professor of Medicine Pediatrics and Director of the Sean Parker Center for Allergy and Asthma Research at Stanford. She is a world-renowned environmental health expert especially on air pollution and how it affects the immune system in all ages. And she and her team are focused on global climate change, um, particularly around wildfire exposures in underserved areas. She's currently at WHO working on air pollution and climate change policy. Um, I, we've asked Dr. Nadeau also to engage in conversation after her presentation with Tamara Tackett-Dent, one of the patient families she sees in her clinic. Dr. Nadeau. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here today. And I am really excited to follow and I'm so honored to be able to work with Michelle and follow Rachel and Delay and Deborah and Noeline's comments because we are on red alert. The IPCC report is extensive, but it's very important because we need to focus on environmental justice for human and planetary health. And we are in danger. And today I'll talk about wildfires and climate, climate change in particular and vulnerable populations, including children. You see here, this little girl is wearing a surgical mask, but as you can imagine, this is not protecting her at all from the toxins associated with wildfire smoke. And so just quickly, wildfires are not just in California, they're all around the world. They're in the Arctic Circle, they're in Kenya, they're in Australia, they're also in Brazil. We've seen the scope by which these wildfires can be devastating, not just wildfires that are accidental in nature, but also anthropogenic, and then also for agricultural purposes. And this is causing a lot of pollution in the air. But it also affects our planet's health. And how is that? It creates a vicious cycle in which the soot is trapped then in our atmosphere and that soot then warms the planet. It creates a blanket around our planet, and then it creates an increasingly positive feedback loop for global warming. So wildfires are dangerous since they circumnavigate the world. There is no safe distance from wildfire smoke. How does it affect us? Well, you, what you can't see or smell could harm you. It's about 10 times as toxic as ambient air pollution because it has different plastics and paint thinners. And as you can imagine, anything under your kitchen sink could be up in the air and it stays up in the air until it rains. And then it goes into the water supply. 
And so the effects on children, on pregnant women, on the elderly are exquisitely different than necessarily in young adults. Wildfire smoke can affect the skin, lung inflammation. It has systemic inflammation with cardiovascular complications, stroke implications. It causes dysfunction of your immune system. It can increase the risk of infections, can also lead to chronic illnesses like diabetes, lower cognition. Wildfire fighters are at high risk for cancer deaths, for example. And we need to understand the longitudinal complications of being exposed to wildfire smoke, which a lot of people around the world are exposed to more than 50 to 100 days of wildfire smoke per year. And this is an example in California. You can see in these graphs where unfortunately because of climate change, the increased risk of the wildfires will be incurred as we warm our planet. This is in Paradise, California, one of the worst disasters in California where many people died because they could not escape the wildfire and they didn't have an evacuation plan. And that evacuation plan included going to the hospital and the hospital was one of the first places that burned down because of the wildfire. In California, unfortunately, most of our fires are caused by humans, not necessarily by accident. And that's important as we think about ways to mitigate wildfires. When you think about the vulnerable, when we think about environmental justice, this is research done at University of California, Berkeley, where socioeconomic status increased the risk of visits to the emergency room with asthma due to wildfires. You can see the increase here compared to people in uh, a higher socioeconomic status. And then importantly, what can we do? Well, Unfortunately, with wildfires, a lot of it depends on relocation, but those that are vulnerable, those that are disenfranchised, don't necessarily have the ability to have the resources to leave or to evacuate, or they don't necessarily have the language capacity and the alert systems to be able to relocate and know where to go and know when to go. And importantly, other personal actions can include closing doors and windows, but that's hard when there's heat stress and other elements of climate change going on at the same time. Staying indoors is a possibility, but many workers depend on their livelihood for being outside. And this is gonna stress the economy as well. Finally, wearing a face mask, for example, in that child, in children, it's not necessarily possible to have a face mask that decreases the risk of wildfire smoke. And unfortunately, children are a vulnerable population with wildfire smoke in particular. But I wanna give you some hope and promise. And like Rachel said, we need to look at those policymakers and we all need to be advocates. And with that in mind, this is a paper that was published by my colleagues at Stanford in the Woods Institute. And here we can see very importantly is if we were to make sure that our policy changes decrease particulate matter from smoke, even by 15%, by 50%, for example, you can see the degree by which you could decrease the risk of premature deaths in adults greater than 65 in this particular instance. So again, change and the decrease of being able to help and adapt to and mitigate wildfires makes a difference in terms of health. So finally, in summary, wildfire chemical makeup and toxicity levels depend on materials and they're about 10 times as toxic as air pollution. It's associated with inflammatory related respiratory and cardiovascular disease. Climate change increases wildfire events and wildfires enhance the effects of climate change. It's the vicious circle. More interdisciplinary research is needed to look at the acute and chronic effects of wildfires, vulnerable populations and disenfranchised populations like children and pregnant women and people of color and people that speak different languages and immigrant populations, they're less likely to evacuate, less likely to get access to resources and healthcare. With increases in wildfires likely in the future, there needs to be ways to mitigate and adapt. And there are plans moving forward as we think about policy changes for global warming and fossil fuel use. There needs to be management also of wildfires and fire ecology as we green the planet and biodiversify the planet. We need to think about how best to use prescribed burns and those that are part of the indigenous collective of knowledge that will also help our nation and as well as our globe. So I wanna stop there and most importantly, share the 
uh, work with my colleague Tamara Dent, who will be talking about her personal experience with wildfires in California. Tamara? Thank you, Dr. Like Nado. Thank you. Um, Tamara, oh, sorry. Tamara is an educator and parent based in Sierra Nevada Mountains of California. She is an active in the community-based solutions supporting health resilience in the face of wildfires and other climate impacts. She and her family have been evacuated dozens of times during the ever extended fire seasons due to the mega fires that have impacted her community. Her family's health has been directly impacted by the effects of wildfires. Tamara is grateful for a forum to help daylight the lingering detrimental effects of wildfire and climate change in the daily lives of so many often forgotten rural communities. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you, Dr. Nadeau. Um, I'm so honored to be here on this panel um, with so many amazing experts. And so I am, as Dr. Nato said, I'm a mom and a music teacher. So <laughs> I feel a little out of my element and I'm very grateful that you're all here um, doing this work. Um, so I will try to just share quickly um, of some video um, from a neighbor um, who took, um, let's see, here we are. This is right near our house. Um, so is that, are you able to see that? Um, so this just shows a little bit, this is one of the, um, yeah, a neighbor next, um, and actually an indigenous family. They've been on this uh, property for over 150 years, good friends of ours. And this is some video that they share. And this is what our summers and fall and increasingly springs often look like. Um, if you see the air, um, this is what it looks like, not just near the fire, but because of, of how our mountains are situated that we sit in and we breathe. Um, you hear about it on the news for maybe a day or two, but um, this goes on for months often. Uh, we were directly impacted by the Creek Fire, the Rim Fire, the Ferguson Fire, the Detweiler Fire, uh, the Junction Fire, the list goes on and on and on. And um, this is um, just part of our everyday living. My kids um, get ready for fire season. Um, they have their bags packed. They, my daughter thinks that that's just a reality that everyone lives with. Um, and my daughter was an infant um, when during our one of our big fires, the Rim Fire, um, and I didn't know enough. I wasn't educated enough that to that we needed to. You know, I kept her inside. I was lucky enough to have HEPA filters going, all those things, but I didn't know the impact. Um, that this would have on a newborn and she's now suffering with um, effects of asthma um, you know she it impacted her lung development she's been hospitalized many times later on um, for lung issues that were directly impacted from this wildfire <clears throat> smoke um, and now whenever there is any sort of smoke she and i i suffer from asthma um, which was completely under control for the most of my adult life until I did move back to this area. And then um, we've ended up in hospitalized, uh, she and I both, um, for different medical issues due, due to this. Um, and in my students, you know, we have weeks and weeks of smoke. Um, we've never been provided masks. Um, you know, there are some families that sometimes have N95 now just because of COVID, but that's still very, very rare. Um, the kids often play outside. Families don't know better than, you know, as soon, if the kid starts coughing, then maybe come inside. Um, we have weeks and weeks of children with headaches in the classroom, um, migraines, uh, nausea, and it goes on and on. And this isn't just something that um, stops when the fire is what we call under control. Um, it, it continues to go on. Um, I'm trying to be mindful of time as well. Um, but we also have a lot of effects um, after the fire where now we have our topsoil is so loose from the burned areas. We have an epidemic of dust in our communities, um, just covering everything, the fine silt dust that you can dust in the morning and two hours later, things are covered all again. 
And um, even in households with, with filters, um, it's becoming a, a major problem. We had a windy day yesterday, and uh, my girlfriend that works at Rural Health said they upped, they were seeing so many people all afternoon coming in with breathing issues because of all of this that is being, um, that is happening. So let me see if I can stop my share here. So let's see. Thank you, Tamara. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dr. Thank Nido. You. Uh, and you. just like you referenced as well with the disparity, um, most of the community can't, can't get out. Um, so that's another big issue for us. Thank you, Tamara. And what do you think if there was one most important policy change that could happen in your community, what would be the most helpful? Um, well, I, I think um, there's so many, but uh, one of the issues is, is even just access to healthcare. We don't have um, a hospital close. The nearest hospital is uh, usually um, for most people over an hour away. Our rural health clinics during these fires are normally shut down because we lose power and they don't have enough gener generators to keep going. Um, my godfather um, during the evacuation um, suffered a heart attack and, and died um, on the scene of his house um, because there just wasn't, um, we, they weren't able to get healthcare quickly enough. We have two um, ambulance that serve an entire 100 mile radius area. Um, so having access to healthcare in, in, in the wildfire, but then also ongoing, um, you know, these rural areas just don't have that access. Um, also air filtration, which you had talked about, that doesn't happen in the schools, it doesn't happen in the buildings. Most people aren't able to have that in their homes and there's no protective equipment. If you noticed in the video, our firefighters don't have masks and they are um, often not protected um, and our children and community members certainly don't have masks or even education of really knowing that that's going to protect them. Thank you. We really appreciate and I'm sorry for your losses and, and for what you've been going through. And we hope that this, as well as many items going on in the CUGH conference, will highlight what you're going through and how we can help. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Kari and Tamara. Um, for a very poignant um, discussion. Um, I think what I'd like to do is open it up to questions. And I've been sort of following the questions in the chat and please feel free to add more. Um, I had some questions, but I'm gonna go right to the chat because I think that's more important. Um, the first question um, goes to um, some 22, 2022 conference person who I don't know it is. And it, it goes to um, Rachel. Um, and this is a question that said, national commitment are voluntary. How do we move to obligatory commitments? Yeah, it's, it's a country, so I assume that's what Yes, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. So we're in a very interesting period of time because we've got um, nat nationally determined contributions, which are, I mean, they're, they're voluntary in that the, there's no sort of global um, uh, compulsion. Uh, and you see around the world different frameworks being used. So there are countries where the um, targets within their nationally determined contributions, their net zero targets are enshrined in law uh, or are enshrined in, in policy uh, that is debated. Um, and so you've got statutory obligations, you've got legal frameworks in some places. In, in many countries, that is not the case. In many countries, I mean, I think the US is slightly different in that in most other countries, sort of the net zero is not contested. What is contested is how do we get there? I think in this country, it's still contested. And then every now and again, you get flare ups of that um, uh, in, in other countries. So, uh, you know, this is so that's the that's the government part of it. And I think that the private part of it and the community part of it is also very important. So if you've got cities that are committing to net zero, which is their articulation of the same kind of commitment. And you've got companies and you've got regions and you've got towns and you've got faith communities, then eventually this all has to start add, adding up. Um, and I think that's where the pressure then comes for, for governments to, to enshrine this. So um, 
there is a question of political pressure, but I think there's also a question of if everybody is trying to get away from that which has caused us tr problems, then uh, the, the scope for governments to sort of fall back uh, and away from uh, their commitments uh, gets smaller. What I hear more and more from, um, uh, notwithstanding the uh, righteous uh, criticism, crit criticism of greenwash, is companies actually asking for regulation. It'd be a lot easier if this stuff was enshrined in law and that they weren't afraid that a government was going to flip-flop. And so I think, you know, communities coming together, demanding this, cities coming together, countries coming, uh, companies coming together, eventually this should, this should be enshrined and there will be no turning back. Now, the question of whether we get there fast enough and whether we implement the right policies and whether we uh, redistribute funds so that we spur that, that's, that's a different question. But I think that increasingly you see no falling back. And even there's announcements coming out from China last week, um, you know, where even at a point where energy supply is constrained because of the war, the net zero is not in question. The question is, how do they get there? And, you know, they're, you can see how carefully through they are, they are thinking about how they actually do that. So uh, I don't think there's a point of reversal. And the question is how quickly we move along the pathway. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Linnea Anasetti. Um, sorry if I mispronounced your name, from UCSF. Um, the question is, there is a high cost for climate change on the individual level, and how do we leverage private companies or the private sector? You sort of somewhat answered that, Rachel. Do you want to expand upon that? Uh, the short answer to this is that uh, companies need to be regulated, that they uh, are transparent about their uh, the de their dependence upon emissions for for profit so that they they need to be transparent that they have a plan to be able to be a successful company uh, in a world where we're decarbonizing they will need to so not only be transparent about what that plan is explain how they're going to get there and then that would have to be regulated you're starting to see in in china and europe and europe and the united kingdom the beginning of stress testing of banks and insurers uh, because obviously this is what we call a macro, the macro prudential risk to the country. If all of the banks are investing in companies that cannot be expected to be successful in a scenario of decarbonization. So you're starting to see this concept of, of carbon risk really beginning to move through the financial system. The United States is now playing catch up. That was Gar what Gary Gensler um, published last week as the uh, draft uh, rules for how the SEC would go. Now, um, we do need effective prices on carbon. We should be putting a price on pollution. We need many, many other things. And then of course, that doesn't help you with redistribution or who are you taxing for what? How do you find the resources available to help communities be able to cope with the worst impacts? But in terms of company accountability, I think it's coming through the financial system, through financial regulation. And this is the work of ministers of finance, not of ministers of environment. Thank you, follow the money. Um, uh, the next question is from Sybil Diver, um, and it goes to Dr. McGregor. Um, she asked, what is your advice for people in think to thinking about scaling in a way, scaling solutions in a way that respects indigenous self-determination and well-being for diverse communities? Question. Um, thank you for that. I think there are some mechanisms in place. So, so for example, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples can be very local, but also very international um, and, and global. But in, in thinking about your question, I started to think that um, that it's not only multi, there isn't different, there's different scales, but there's also has to be multifaceted. So for example, the kind of advocacy that has to happen at COP meetings. So I think about some of the work that Indigenous Climate Action and others do that kind of lobbying that has to happen there in order to influence at that level, but also down to uh, a local level, developing a toolkit so that you know indigenous community can start develop their own climate change um, solutions, strategies, policies, and and governance frameworks um, in their own communities. So I think that there there are these mechanisms that exist um, exist at different levels, but but there also needs to be um, more input into assessment, like how we're even defining the problem in the first place. So in Canada, um, there was a specific chapter on Indigenous health for the um, health climate assessment that was released last month, I think. 
that's the first time that's ever happened. So you're getting that particular perspective and it's national. But the First Nations uh, Health Authority in British Columbia also has very specific localized um, solutions. So all of these require support. Um, that hasn't been sort of coherent in terms of how this fits into a broader framework like the uh, Climate Science 250 is a national framework. Um, the other thing that I would add is um, understanding what uh, like what Indigenous leadership is going to look like. It's going to look different. So when I when I think about because you're often on the outside looking in, others have pointed out to this. That's part of the inequity and the injustice. So what are the things that you do to try to have an influence? And a lot of it is um, land defense and land protection. And the recent report that the Indigenous Environment Network put out pointed to these land defense and um, efforts result in keeping carbon in the ground. So it's, so it's decarbonizing, but it doesn't get recognized as climate leadership or, or efforts. And this happens at different, um, at different scales. So there's a lot to, to say there, but I wanna make sure other questions get answered, but happy to chat more about that. It's a great question. And, uh, and thank you for, uh, for allowing me to have a chance to talk about some of these ideas. Miigwech. Thank you. It's the end of our session, but I would like to take a few more questions. Uh, people want to leave for the break, feel it's a 30 minute break, um, but I'd like to um, continue with some of the questions. So the next question goes uh, from Jonathan Paps, Pats, um, which really um, talks about disinformation. I think this goes to Carrie and Tamara, uh, which is how do you build evidence um, or a narrative against disinformation to counter the blaming of land management instead of climate change? Mm -hmm. It's an excellent question. Um, I think that when you actually look at the data now, and this is really for everyone to know, it used to be the case that when we look at land management, which is part of the problem, but it's not the whole problem for sure. And when we look at climate change and we look at the drought conditions and we look at the warming of the planet, there are circumstances of wildfires that would never have been able to happen without that circumstance of climate change. We saw that in Canada, we're seeing that in the Arctic. So the fact is, is that the climate is warming, the fuel source is warming, we're enduring more and more droughts, and that high pressure system is also affecting our inability to change the wildfire landscape. It's getting worse and worse. And so with that, climate change is a key part of what's been at the root of the increasing risks of wildfires. I think what Jonathan's asking is, you know, how do we counter the disinformation going out there? If I can uh, just... I... Sure, go ahead, Tamara. Just jump in. I'm just on a very, very local level. Um, I live in, you know, many in my area um, are of the opinion or or in that and in a group that may not believe that, you know, beforehand that climate change was real. But however, in the last few years, that narrative locally in very small communities has changed as, um, you know, this is only I'm sitting here in only our second rain of this entire year. Wells are going dry. When people are finding <laughs> fires, there's no water for the firefighters to draw from. So they are the impact is being felt so so heavily in our communities that people are starting to notice and say well climate change is real i don't have water anymore we don't have water systems there's no other way for people to get water they're bringing it from the store so uh, just on that note the, the the impact is so dramatic that people are are starting to believe yeah it's there's two great articles that i'll put in the chat um or I'll send them to people if you'd like that actually relate the science behind the climate change and wildfires that is irrefutable. Um, thank you. That's great to hear from the science and from the community level. Um, I'm Deli, I'm gonna ask you, cause not everybody reads the chat. You answered it in the chat, but I think everybody is interested in how on an individual level, can you reduce your e-waste? Yeah, it, uh, the obvious answer is reduce your consumption, but it's not, it's easier said than done. We all now depend on uh, all the gadgets. However, you don't have to get the latest one. My colleagues still make fun of me about my iPhone 7, which I got uh, six years ago, but it still works. It, it takes fuzzy pictures. Uh, so I think that's uh, one way that individuals can practice what we believe in, that we can reduce consumption. And I think it cuts across a lot of the uh, topics that we've, we've covered today. 
the second uh, solution that we as individuals can, can take is uh, when you do have to dispose of a product because it doesn't work or suit your needs anymore, there are now opportunities to do a little bit of research, uh, maybe 10 minutes on Google to find a local uh, disposal facility near where you live. Goodwill takes them in a special category. I've visited the Goodwill e-waste uh, recycling center here in Southern California. And uh, we actually have research saying people are willing to drive up to four miles to take their uh, electronic gadgets uh, to a particular facility. It adds cost, but it's something that at least in this country we can uh, uh, hopefully uh, afford. Um, and you know, finally, it's also putting our money uh, where our beliefs are. Many companies now will charge a little bit more for uh, electronics that have uh, done away with some of the most notorious toxic materials. I think we need to keep uh, working with them, uh, advocating to make sure that uh, they invest properly in not just the economics of their products, but also in the safety, they, taking into consideration that these products do end up in corners of the world where people don't have uh, the ability to protect themselves from uh, the, the materials. So I think uh, there are many, many things that individuals can do. We do rely on international policies, but these small steps uh, will send the right signals uh, that this is a very serious uh, challenge. Thank you. So I'm going to end it here. Um, this is a fabulous session. I have to thank everybody on. Um, I mean, I'm honored to be part of this session. Um, really fantastic conversation, fantastic questions. Um, and here's here's to a fossil fuel fuel free world um, and everybody be well. Thank you so much.